So exam question, this was a calculator question, maximum mark 5. If f of x is the natural log minus 5x for x greater than 0, they're telling us that just because natural log of x is not defined when x is negative, find the derivative. So part A, no problem. That's our regular derivative laws. We have to remember that the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. Things are good. Find the second derivative. Well, if you're finding the second derivative here, probably I would think of this 1 over x as an x to the negative 1. And then you're able to do your derivative quite easily that way as well. Of course, the derivative of the negative 5 would just be 0, so it becomes negative 1 over x squared. Part C says solve when f prime of x equals f double prime of x. So we have, at this moment, this equation. If you have a calculator available on an exam, and this is in a calculator section, get used to using it as a quicker way. I know we could work at this algebraically, but if you type the left-hand side into y1 and the right-hand side into y2, it, gro it draws a crazy graph but on that graph, you could find the two intersection points. Round those to three sig figs. And in this situation, we get an answer that is less than zero. So we have to remember, originally, the domain of our question was that x was bigger than zero. So you solve for that second answer, then you put an x through it to show that it doesn't exist. Okay? That's where this question took it to that next level, getting us to think back to our domain, what was all involved, and being able to cancel that answer out. Okay. Now, algebraically, you could have multiplied everything here by x squared. Made one side equal to 0, and you would have got 5x squared minus x minus 1. You could have got this into a quadratic equation. At this point, that quadratic equation does not factor. You could use the quadratic formula. You could plug that equation, that parabola, into y1 and find out where that parabola has x-intercepts. The x-intercepts actually might be nicer if you say, hey, Mr. JR, that didn't take me too long to change that to a parabola. Maybe I would like that better because these two graphs are hard to see the intersection points. Maybe I would like to change it to 5x squared minus x minus 1, graph that, and find the x-intercepts instead. You would get these exact same answers, except obviously you still have to cancel out the negative one because of our domain. Seven mark question. Consider f of x, g of x, and h of x, where h of x equals f composition g of x. The first thing I personally do whenever I see this notation is I change it to the notation I'm more comfortable with. Maybe you're more comfortable with that notation and not the one that I wrote above. That's great. But whichever one you're more comfortable with, change the notation to something that you can work with better, okay? Given that g of 3 equals 7, g prime of 3 equals 4, f prime of 7 equals negative 5, find the gradient to, of the normal to the curve of h at x equals 3. So, if we haven't seen a question like this before, this is one of those times where you read the question and then just go, 
what? And you might be, and then you think about it for a while, and you might skip it, you might leave it blank. This, this question on the exam was left blank probably by a lot of students. So we have to break it down a little bit. What are they wanting to find? Find the gradient of the normal, okay? So that's the slope of the normal of h. Well, how do we find slopes of normals? We find a slope of our tangent, and then we do the negative reciprocal because the normal is perpendicular. How do we find slopes of tangents? We use the derivative. So the first thing that, after reading the question, we realize is we have to find h prime of x. In fact, we have to find h prime of 3. This is the decontextual derivative. You're used to doing the chain rule when you have actual functions with actual x. But you can still do the chain rule with just functions. This is the definition of the chain rule. Okay? G of x is inside f of x. So we do the derivative of the outside function, the outside function being f. So we have f prime. Keep the inside function the same. Multiplied by the derivative of the inside function. So now we're using the rule that we've used all the time, but we're applying it just to functions and not actual equations. And this is where all the other information comes into play. They've told us what g of 3 is. They've told us what f prime of 7 is. They told us what g of g prime of 3 is. And surprise, surprise, right? You plug things in. g of 3 happens to be 7. So now we have f prime of 7 times g prime of 3 was given to us to be 4. Multiply this out, and we find that our slope of our tangent line is negative 20. So the slope of our normal line will be 1 over 20. Mm -hmm. Again, it was given, all of this information was given to us at the beginning. So they've allowed you to say, here are the components you're going to need without the equation. A normal question that we've done is, here are the equations, and you plug in 3 to find out what it is. Now they've taken the situation or the equations out of it and just told you the pertinent information you would need. But they want to see, do you understand the chain rule? Do you understand how its components work? so that if we take it out of context, you can still work with the question. So lately, with chain rule, product rule, and sometimes quotient rule, the exam is like to do this. They like to give, just give you components of something without an equation and say, can you work with these rules theoretically? Can you understand that if that g of x here, this notation means g of x is inside of f of x. The chain rule says we do our derivative of our outside function, multi keep our inside function the same, then multiply by the derivative of our inside function. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, thank you. M normal is positive. I said that, but it didn't appear. All right, question number three. 16 marks. Love these 16 mark questions. I think the record on the exam was a 24 mark question that I've seen. I might, I'll, that's crazy for math, don't you think? Of course, it has A, B, C, D. Oh, this one just A, B, C. Some of them go up to like E, F, G. So consider the function f. 
the line L1 with equation y equals 3x plus 1 is tangent to the graph of f when x equals 2. This is another favorite IB exam thing to do. Take a typical question, and our typical question is, here's the actual function f. Can you find the equation of the tangent line? We have done loads of those. That's our typical question. So then take a typical question and say, hmm, maybe I give you the middle, or maybe I give you the very end. Can you work backwards, or could you start in the middle and work forwards and backwards with the information that you need. So in this case, they're telling us the end. They're telling us that the equation of the tangent line was 3x plus 1. Can you work backwards and find f prime of 2? So one of the things you do in a question like this is you review the process forward. If I was finding the equation of a tangent line, and I was given the equation, I'd find my derivative. I'd use my derivative to plug in a point to find my slope. I would then take my slope and a point, so I'd also plug in, in this case, x equals 2 into my original equation to find a point. Then I'd use my slope and my point to find the equation of my tangent line. So you need to have that process well known because now it's sort of like, ooh, I got to the end. What would I have had to do right before this? Well, I would have probably plugged in my slope and my other point to find that equation. Well, what does that mean? It means that I knew a point and a slope. Can you tell me the slope of this line? 3. So f prime of 2 is going to be 3. Well, what's f of 2? Well, normally I would have plugged in the point 2 into my original equation to find the y-coordinate. And then I would have used that same point to find my equation of my tangent line. What does that mean? That, mean, that means that that point is also on your tangent line. So all I need to do is plug 2 into my tangent line, find my y-coordinate is 7, and so the point 2 comma 7 is also on my original line. And then they add another layer. Part B gets this layer added on. Let g of x equal f of x squared plus 1 and p be the point on the graph of g where x equals 1. Show that the graph of g has a gradient of 6 at p. So what do we know here? First of all, when x equals 1, g of x, g of 1 is equal to f of 2. So there's our connection to what we have above. If we want to find the derivative of g of x, so if we want to find the gradient of g, we have to find the derivative. And what do we have here? we have a chain rule embedded in this question very sneakily, perhaps to say. Can you see that x squared plus 1 is inside f of x? And we haven't found f of x actual equation yet. However, we are allowed to find the derivative of the outside function, keep the inside the same, then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Once you've done that, g prime of 1 will just be f prime of 1 squared plus 1, which is f prime of 2, which we knew already, 
but it gets multiplied by 2 because of the chain rule. And so getting our value from above, we show that it's equal to 6. Now, this part B is an example of where an IB exam in this question, which is part B, is a nasty question. It's hard for it to see that chain rule and to make that connection. Most likely would be something many of us would go, I didn't see that. I'm pressured in the exam. I'm not knowing where I'm going. I'm stuck. Okay? You need to know the gradient of G in order to keep going in C. And so where the IB exam is kind, they tell you what the answer is. And they say, show that the graph has a gradient of 6. If you screw up and can't do that, it means you still can keep going. So even though, right, here we've got our, how many marks was this one? 16 mark question. You barely got through the four marks in part A, and you get to part B, and you're like, I don't know how to do part B. So a lot of students then make the mistake of not doing part C. That costs you 12 marks. If you can't do part B, which is five marks on this exam, the fact that it's a show that says you can keep going. You can use that, and maybe you can get part C, given the information that you have from part A and part B, because all of your answers are there. Let L2 be the tangent to the graph at G, at P. L1 intersects L2, L1 was our first line, at the point Q. Find the coordinates of Q. So, what do we know? We already know the one equation of the line, y equals 3x plus 1. We need to find out where it intersects within a second line. What do we need? We need to find that second line. So what do we know so far? At P, x is equal to 1, and m is equal to 6. g of 1 is equal to f of 1 squared plus 1, which is f of 2. And we already figured out that f of 2 was 7. So now we have a slope and a point that on g of x the slope is 6 and the point is 1 comma 7. So you can use either y equals mx plus b or your point slope formula to find the equation. y minus 7 equals 6x minus 1. Rearrange that and you get y equals 6x plus 1. Found line 2. Once you've got line 2, we already knew what line 1 was. So we can take line 1 and line 2 and say, hey, just by observation, I notice they have the same y-intercept. So that's the quickest way to solve this. Otherwise, you'd have to use a system of equations, use substitution or elimination to get your answer. Question number four, back to a six mark question. Let f of x equal one plus e to the negative x and g of x equal two x plus b for all real numbers where b is a constant. Again, composition, notation, probably the first thing I would do is change it to a notation that I'm familiar with. The composition is equal to negative 3. Find the value of b. Well, algebraically, 
this would mean that the 1 plus e to the negative x goes inside the function of g of x. So we can write it like this. We can expand it and because that is equal to, here, that's part B. Oh, just part A was just to find the composition. There we go. Part B is where we're going to find the value of B. So put the composition together and now the limit as x goes to infinity is equal to negative 3. So now we have to think about what do limits do, what happens as x gets really, really big in this situation. What is e to the negative 1,000? Get close to. Gets close to 0. Remember our negative exponent, that e to the negative x, is 1 over e to the x. And as x gets bigger, e to the exponent x will also get bigger. And 1 over a very large number gets closer and closer to 0. So taking that in mind, this just becomes 2 plus b plus 0 is equal to negative 3. And then solving for b is easy. It's just equal to negative 1. Or sorry, negative 5.